As Shelby said, I'm Kim Coward, and I'm the horticulture agent in Franklin County. I'm really glad to be here. Um, just a little explanation, the way horticulture agents work for extension. Um, you all know about, you have an extension office here with a great service. Horticulture agents are paid directly by your county's taxes. So we tend to stay within our own counties. Your agent, Jamie Dockery, was busy today and had some other things going on, so that's why I'm here. Um, but I'm glad to be here. I do, we do cross-programming and train back and forth, so it's not a problem for me to come out and speak with you all today. And I did bring the Herald today. There's an excellent article, and this is what I'm mostly going to be talking about. I'm going to talk about the homeowner perspective of lawn care and also the environmentally friendly ways and methods that we can manage as homeowners. Um, this is a great article. I was sitting back there reading it and circling. Um, the perspective that's given in here is kind of what I'm all about. I, do, I did go to school in the same era as David. My husband went to school with David and has a turf degree um, also, just like David does. So I do come from the same background in the same, the same era there, the same time frame, the same learning, where we did a lot of chemical applications, and that was our bottom line for doing lawn care. And now we're changing because we know a lot of our lawn care practices are not really good for us as human beings, some of the chemicals and some of the things, but they're also bad for our earth and our environment. And Shelby talked about storm water. So there's a lot of reasons why we want to look at what we do and maybe change some of our practices. And then also, like David was trying to do, was help you all be able to talk to lawn care companies that maybe uh, you use on your your home or maybe your place of business or wherever else you are, school or whatever. One of the things I like to talk about is why do we have lawns? It's really important for us to understand it before we can move to a different place. So when we started lawns, we use them for recreation purposes. They're beautiful. We like to look at green things around us, but it does also prevent soil loss, and it's really important to keep that soil where, it, where we want it for our other plants to grow. It helps keep dust down. If you've ever been in a, in a place where they've taken all the soil away pre-construction or a field and you can see the dust blowing, well, that's losing valuable topsoil. It prevents runoff, as Shelby talked about in the stormwater presentation, and we're going to talk about that in just a minute. Those good deep roots that soil, um, that turf grass has in your, in your lawn helps keep that soil in place and prevents it from running and other things running into our stormwaters. Also, it provides oxygen for us to breathe, which I kind of think that's a really important point. So, um, Turf grass... There's about 31 million acres of turf grass in the United States, and most of that is in homeowner lawns. We tend to think or want to think that it's in football fields, golf courses, you know, large places like that, but it's not. When you add up all of the lawns that we all have across the United States, that's where most of our turf grass is located. And um, so that there's, and there's also more than 30 billion billion with a B in dollars spent on annual home lawn maintenance. And that is those of us that are paying a lawn care company and all the supplies they buy, plus homeowners buy just an inordinate amount of chemicals and seed and fertilizers and just everything, mowers, the gas to go in our mowers to keep our lawns looking green like David talked to us earlier. We want it to look green. Green's good. But we want to also talk about the environmental impacts here. So plants are cool. They cool our environment. If you were standing out in the middle of, a, of your lawn or a bigger field, like a football field or the golf course, and you feel you may be hot, it may be August, and it may be you know, 90 degrees in the shade, but if you were to stand there and then go stand in the middle of the parking lot over here at the mall, it's going to be a huge difference. So it's really important to have these green spaces around to keep our planet cooler, which and this has a lot of benefits for us and for the planet. 
So you can see the difference is between 7 to 14 degrees. So if you want to try it, um, you know, which is a, cool, a neat thing for kids to do, is to give them a, a thermometer and let them stand out in the middle of your lawn or in, front, in a golf course or whatever, and then let them take them out to a, a parking lot and let them stand in the middle of their school parking lot, and they can see what the temperature difference is just by standing there. It's really neat. Also, like Shelby was alluding to earlier, that lawns can draw down runoff water and they also absorb and can filter some of the chemicals that come from our rainwater, that come from uh, turf applications for chemicals or anything else that's running through your lawn. If, if it's running off your street and runs through your lawn or runs from your neighbor's lawn to your lawn, it does absorb a lot of those chemicals and it does, the roots do help filter out a lot of those chemicals. So what comes out of a lawn, a turf area, is cleaner than something that comes off of a street or a hardscape. So that's another important factor for having a good, healthy lawn. Also, grass plants help rejuvenate and create soil as they break, die and break down. You've got to remember your lawn, while you think of it as just one big thing, it's made up of hundreds and billions of tiny little individual plants, okay? There's just millions and billions of them out there, but you look at it as one big thing. But as all those tiny little plants break down, die and regrow and rejuvenate, as they decompose into the soil, it's creating a healthier soil for you. So having a good healthy lawn is good for your soil. We want to talk about sustainable lawn practices and the way we get around those is we want to make sure we're doing good cultural practices, okay? We want to make sure that we manage our lawns appropriately. These practices help us use less water, less chemicals, and they use less energy. And also, it puts less chemicals into our ground when we use sustainable practices. And it also benefits the good microbes, the good insects, and helps people too without all those inputs. When we go to an earth-friendly lawn, we're going to talk about turf grass selection, which David alluded to earlier. We're going to talk about how do we mow and maintain our lawns. We're going to talk about how we water and how we do insect and disease control and how do we use pesticides. So how are we going to get started? We're going to soil test because soil tests um, help us we just talked about with David the nitrogen use and fertilizer uses and some of you had some questions about lime and phosphorus and potassium. The way you learn what you need in your soil is to do a soil test and I've got some handouts up here and one of them talks about how do you take a soil sample and it goes through step by step on how to do that and then I also brought soil bags and I noticed there were some on the table. Um, these soil bags, we use them in Kentucky at any extension office in the state and each, each uh, county has one extension office in it. So you can take these and the cost diff is different in every county. Um, and I'm not sure, I forgot to check with Jamie what the cost is here in Fayette County. But you can take these to do a soil test with. What comes back is the it's six dollars here in Fayette County okay so six dollars for one test which is really a good deal for you because it tells you exactly how much fertilizer you need to put on your lawn to do it for yourself it tells you how many pounds of nitrogen if you need phosphorus or potassium and if you need lime because you don't always need to lime so that's a really good deal for you some of the tests that you may buy over the counter are not very reliable and you have to kind of make the determinations yourself and so doing the math which i am not a math person at all so you just get it back and you go, okay, it tells me to put on 10 pounds of nitrogen and they want me to put on urea, which is 4600, and it tells me exactly. So I go to the store and that's what I buy and I'm good. So it's a really good deal to soil test. So it keeps you from over chemicaling or over fertilizing your lawn, keeps you from putting lime on that you may not need just because you've always done it or your neighbor told you to do it or your dad said to do it. Um, and it also, it helps you know that 
you've got grass over here, it needs this. You can also do one for your vegetable garden, which is a whole different system of plants, which is here. And maybe you're growing blueberries over here in a little section. Those need all different kinds of fertilizers. So this kind of test, the soil test is gonna tell you exactly what you need for what you're gonna use. And it also saves you money. And then also it's bad for the earth to be putting too much chemicals into it. And we talked about turf grass selection with David and you saw a list of various kinds. And he told you that I'd be really telling you about tall fescue. And that's what I'm gonna do because that is the grass that we recommend here in Kentucky. A lot of us, and probably your neighborhoods here, had Kentucky bluegrass at one point in time. And that's what we had that was a good grass for us, but as, our, as we've warmed up and gotten drier summers and drought, um, as we've put in new subdivisions where the soil is mostly clay or hard pan, because they took all the topsoil and put it who knows where, but not back in our lawns, our Kentucky bluegrasses don't grow here very well anymore. We lost almost all of them in the droughts, the, the two droughts back to back that David alluded to that were in the late 80s um, because bluegrass does not take dry at all. It just doesn't take any kind of drought. It has to have a lot of moisture and the temperatures have to be cooler. But these turf type tall fescues are bred so that they will take the drought, they will take the heat, and they will grow in a lot of different kinds of soils. Um, they're very fine textured, and you can't tell, you all wouldn't be able to tell them from a bluegrass unless you really get down with your microscope and look at the surface of the leaf blade and the way it comes out of the sheath and all those little identification features. Um, it does grow very slowly under dry conditions, but it's very drought tolerant. It doesn't go dormant like our warm season grasses. This is a cool season grass, and it uses less water. Sometimes we use perennial rye grasses, and when we do have Kentucky bluegrasses, because some people just want those kinds of things, those also you have to irrigate a lot, which is more water, which costs you more money, and then also they don't live very well in the hot, dry areas. We always want to make sure when we're using fertilizers, we're going to switch gears here a little bit, um, and the question came up about how um, there was a question earlier about fertilizers and how do we keep them out of our storm water and what do we do with that. When you put your fertilizer on, you want to make sure that you're avoiding drain areas. And Shelby showed us some, um, some paths that run along the edges of sidewalks and streets and that go into the storm water system. When you're putting fertilizer on with your spreader and your lawn, and this is, applies to your lawn care company. You can talk to them uh, this way as well. Those granular fertilizers, if they hit the sidewalk, hit your driveway, hit the street, you want to make sure and clean them up. You need to blow them back up into your lawn or sweep them up so that they don't go down into your storm water system. What happens then is it does, we showed, Shelby showed us a great example of how that winds up in our creek streams and rivers, and we live on the, directly on the Kentucky River in Frankfurt. Um, and those, there's a lot of subdivisions that have some kind of a pond or a lake as part of a feature in their neighborhoods. Fertilizers don't care if it's turf grass, if it's a tree, if it's a lake or a stream or a pond. If it's green, it's gonna make it grow. And so when these fertilizers hit our waters, a lot of times they'll make the algae grow, they'll make our aquatic plants grow, which then use up the valuable oxygen that are in our waterways and streams and take the oxygen out of the water so we don't have fish anymore, we don't have all the good things that happen in waterways and it essentially kills our waterways. Um, Oh, let's see if I have a slide in here. Um, also, we talk about um, in some of our wells, and I think I have a slide here in a little bit, about how much fertilizer is showing up in our well water and sometimes even in our drinking water. And David talked about this when we put on fertilizers. This is going back to putting them on and using them as a homeowner. And if you want to have that good green green color early in the spring. Like David talked about, we only really want to fertilize as homeowners in the fall. And if you have to have the green up, you apply a half rate. But on our crabgrass preventers that David talked about that you can buy over the counter and our other weed products, those chemicals are born on a fertilizer pellet. 
So you're getting fertilizer in your lawn anyway if you're using a crabgrass pre-emergent product, okay? So you don't want to put additional fertilizer on. And as David talked about, all that does is make the top grow. It's not making our roots healthy, which grow in the fall. We're going to do that better in the fall. So you really want to watch putting them on. Um, and David talked about and said that I would really keep repeating myself on apply fertilizers in the fall and uh, do them according to that soil test that we talked about. So that's really important. Um, and also only use the amounts that the soil test tells you to use because more is not always better, particularly with lawn and garden chemicals. Okay, that's important to remember. We're going to move on to mowing because we've, we've fertilized, we've talked about that, and so that's going to make our lawn grow. And our lawns can grow all year, all year long. Um, we, the t only time we really don't get a lot of growth is in the middle of the summer, um, here in the July, August, when we get less rainfall and it's really, really hot. Our cool season grasses tend to slow down. Um, but if we want to, to mow all year long, we want to mow even into the winter months, if it warms up and our grass is still growing. But we want to, if we mow well and mow appropriately, we're going to need less chemical in our lawn because we're going to have a healthier grass and a healthier turf stand, which is what we want to keep down the chemical use. What we want to do is mow high, mow often, and return our clippings to the lawn. With a turf type tall fescue, two to three inches is the best height to mow. Now on your lawn mower, you may b not believe this, but you can raise and lower that deck. You may have to get some WD-40 and a hammer out there to, if you haven't done it for a while, to get that little thing to go up and down there, but you can do it. It can raise and it can lower. And what you want to think about is, I talked about all those thousands and thousands of little tiny individual grass plants in there. All of us learned in school about how plants photosynthesize and you need the green part of the plant, the leaf, to make food and energy as that plant photosynthesizes. If you mow your grass plant down to an inch or even an inch and a half, you're cutting off all the green leaf part that is the part that photosynthesizes to make that grass plant grow. Okay, so what you've got when you're mowing at less than two inches is no photosynthesizing part, nothing for that plant to make energy. So that's why your lawn thins out, that's why your grass will tend to brown out a lot in the fall, and that's why you have a very thin, poor stand and you're just not happy. And it doesn't look good to you and you've got a lot of weeds and you just have continual problems. If you'll raise your mowing height two to three inches, you're going to be a lot happier with your lawn. Also, returning clippings to your lawn, as David talked about, those top pieces that you're removing, they do decompose very rapidly in the soil. They will sift down through that tall fescue lawn and hit the ground, and you can actually get 25% of your nitrogen that you need for the year if you'll just return your clippings to the lawn. You want to mow in different directions. I always tell the classes I teach for lawn care, if you do nothing else, then mow in different directions when you mow, you'll notice an immediate improvement. Instead of going in that same circle all the time, if you'll reverse the circle the next time, then mow north to south one time, then mow east to west, and then you can go back to your circle again, you will notice a huge difference because your grass will start growing. It's just kind of like when you part your hair and for so long you've combed your hair the same way, it kind of grows that way after a while. Your lawn grass is going to do the exact same thing and it makes it lay down, okay? Even though you may not notice it so much, you will notice it if you reverse that and it's going to make it stand up better. It's going to be able to get sunlight and irrigation and rain water better and absorb any chemical that you may want to use or need to use better and you're going to have a healthier turf grass. So that's the one takeaway point if you don't get anything else out of what I say all day. That's the one thing that you can do. And then also you want to continue mowing through the winter and spring um, and very early spring. We've already mowed once at our house because we've gotten some warm weather. Um, 
and it's, it's popping up. Like David said, he would have mowed today, but he's got this other long laundry list of things today. But it's time to mow, even to knock the tops off. And some of that will help with your wild garlic. If you go ahead and knock the tops of some of those very early spring weeds off, that's going to keep them mowed back, and they're not going to be able to absorb the sunlight and the rainwater so well. And you'll keep your, um, your weed populations down. Some of the things you can do to be environmentally friendly is to go electric or to use human powered equipment or to use native species. And I, this is, there are several models of this. I've put the um, link to where I got that off of some guy's blog spot, but there's actual plans for making one of these. Uh, and then you can just pedal and see if you don't want to push. You can ride and you can cut your lawns. And this is a rotary mower, um, which goes this way. A, a, and our most, a real mower, which goes like this. It's used mostly on golf courses for warm season turfs. Um, and our, ours are, re are rotary mowers that go around this way, but you could use this if you like. So that's kind of interesting. Um, one of the things that I really encourage you to do, which is kind of what's been encouraged in the article in the Herald today, is to go with native species that don't require mowing. You can um, replace your lawn grass. Think about replacing your lawn grass or sections of your lawn grass with native um, perennial flowering plants. There are native grasses that you don't mow. They look like grass. They have beautiful seed heads, and there are some that are short and some that are tall. It provides interest. You know, if we, if we have a lawn and it's all solid green, we might as well go out there and pave it and paint it green because there's very little interest. It's a big, solid mass of green. And what we'd like to see is some interesting things. We'd like to see some color. How about a little patch of yellow here? What about a little tuft of of you know, a nice plumy, purpley looking grass over here. What about something different, even if it's in small patches? And that's going to save you energy and money on mowing. You know, gas prices are, you know, they came down. I went to see cats last night from the time I left Frankfurt to the time I got back from Frankfurt, gas prices dropped 10 cents. So, you know, what's up with that? So it's going to, you know, it's going to probably go back up by the time I get back to Frankfurt today. So it's going to cost us a lot more money to mow our lawns. And, you know, why do you want to do that when you can do something more interesting and not spend all the money on gas or the chemical to maintain your lawn? We talked about not bagging it um, for our grass. And here's the statistic on the 25% you can save yearly on your, on your fertilizer bill. Also, the, the short clippings will, will infiltrate down. When you're mowing, you all will only want to take off one-third of the leaf blade of your grass. So don't let it grow up tall and then cut it half in two. That's the mowing frequently part. If you'll take off one-third of that blade every time you mow, you're going to keep a good, even, consistent cut. But then also, you're not going to be taking off so much of that photosynthesizing capacity from that little tiny grass plant. And you're going to have a healthy lawn. So, you know, get somebody else to mow for a while. Um, you know, just make sure that you're not letting it really jump. You may have to mow more often, but also if you're not putting fertilizer on in the spring, it is going to reduce some of your mowing that you're doing in the spring. Also with, in, with thatch, um, Kentucky bluegrass, David talked about this a little bit. Kentucky bluegrass did develop thatch. It's the way the physiology of the grass, that anatomy of Kentucky bluegrass. Turf type tall fescues do not develop thatch. They're, it's a, it's a, it is grass, but it's a different species of grass, and it just doesn't do that, okay? So it's not going to develop the thatch, and clippings do not contribute to thatch, okay? So it's important to know that. Also, the old lawn chemicals, David talked about how chemicals are changing dramatically. The old lawn chemicals that we used to use um, in the 70s, the early 80s, and before, they were much more harsh in our soils and on our plants. So they did contribute also to thatch in the way that the um, weed plants and the grass plants broke down. So there was some more, there was thatch. So if you're talking to a lawn care company and they want to de-thatch your lawn every year, it's really not a necessary thing for you to have them do. If you've got a turf type 
tall fescue in your lawn and you're maintaining it well. So that's one kind of little tip when you're talking to your lawn care company that you know maybe you're paying for a service that really doesn't need to be done. Um, here's another little statistic on clippings. The average lawn produces 233 pounds per thousand square feet, so that's where we get back to that 25% savings in our nitrogen. And our landfills are filling up with grass clippings and lawn waste, and Lexington does a great job at picking that up. Um, we're just starting to do some of that in Frankfurt, but it's keeping all that out of our, out of our landfills, which is a really big problem as we fill our landfills up with things that really don't need to be there that can be handled in a different manner. Um, you can use as, as mulch in your vegetable garden. You can use your clippings as mulch around your trees if you want to scrape away, uh, rake them up, or if you do have to mow high one time and it's really matted, or maybe the first time that you mow in the spring. One of the things you have to watch if you're chemically treating your lawn in any way, shape, or form, those um, blades will hold on to that chemical some and that is not good to use on your vegetable garden in particular because if you're using 2,4-D products or any of your other weed killers those chemicals can harm your vegetable plants so if you're using your grass clippings it's better to compo compost them first and then use them as mulch in your garden or around your trees and shrubs but if you're managing your lawn in a very healthy way, mowing appropriately, fertilizing only in the fall, using turf type tall fescue, um, you can use those just right straight off your lawn and not have any issue at all. For drought tolerance, if you're doing all the things I talked about, your lawn is really going to be drought tolerant. Um, one of the biggest things is irrigating, which we'll talk about next, but we want to use our turf type tall fescue because it is very drought tolerant. It'll take a lot of abuse. Um, it'll slow down in the drought and it may stop growing in the drought and it may brown up a little bit in the drought, but if you're not over irrigating or over chemicaling or over fertilizing and if you're mowing between two and three inches, It'll go dormant, but as soon as we get rain fall back on it, it'll pop back up and do very well. You may need to overseed a little bit, but not so much if you're managing it correctly. And we saw this, we've got some data now um, at the university and where we've looked at it just observing over the last several droughts we've had in the last you know, five to 10 years where we're seeing people who manage their lawns appropriately are recovering better than those that have irrigation systems that are watering it routinely, that are doing heavy fertilizer applications and all those things. Those are the lawns that we lose completely and the people have to start all over again. If you want to switch to the tall fescue, do, can you just overseed with it or do you have to destroy the old lawn and then seed with the tall fescue? Um, when you're switching from a bluegrass lawn probably to a tall fescue lawn, you can overseed it if you do it correctly and you're going to have to do it over a period of probably two to three years and you want to make sure and slit seed into that. That's a, a piece of equipment that you can drill directly into it. And the, the tall fescue is a little bit more aggressive than the bluegrass. Um, if you want to do it very quickly and in one season, then you can um, apply a total kill weed killer such as Roundup or Finale and then you let that die and then you seed into that with your tall fescue. I've got a publication up here on renovating lawns and we can talk about that with that publication when we're done, but that's a good question. Um, also, when we're talking about drought tolerance, we definitely want to be mowing or raising our mowing height up to three inches. Um, with that three inch as the, as the top grow, as the top mowing height, that's going to help our grass plant be healthier. We don't want to fertilize at all in the spring, and that's really important. I can't emphasize that enough because. Who knows what it's going to do in July and August? We don't know if it's going to quit raining for two days or six weeks or three months or whatever. So, you know, why put fertilizer on and then go, oops, later on? You know, if you haven't put fertilizer on already, don't. You know, just don't do it, and your lawn's going to be better off on the end. Wait and fertilize in the fall. Um, and allow the turf to harden off. If you're doing some irrigating, if you're doing chemical applications, 
you know, and when you're mowing, you know, gradually back off of that as we see our drought conditions come up. Look at the well, long-term weather forecast and you can kind of kind of ballpark that and keep people off your lawn. Keep the kids off the lawn. If you can pull your animals, your pets off the lawn, you know, don't drive your big lawn tractor over it. If you don't have to, you're not going to be mowing much anyway. So, you know, just don't let people on the lawn if we're in a drought situation. When you water under normal conditions, you want to water deeply and infrequently. You want to wet the soil down to a depth of five to six inches every time you water, if you're watering. Um, this is when you're putting on new seed. When you're seeding your lawn, you're going to want to water probably probably every other day at first, depending on the weather conditions, and then back that off as you see the little tiny grass seedlings come up. The rule of thumb is an inch of water per week. But when you put that on, you want to make sure it's soaking down into your soil, okay? You can use a rain gauge. You can use a straight-sided container that you've just marked with a marker up to an inch. You can use like a tuna fish or a cat food can under your irrigation water, and when it fills up, you're done. You know, but then dig down. Don't just guess. I can't tell you how long it's going to take because I don't know your water pressure. I don't know what kind of you know, sprinkler you're using, they're all different. But dig down in there, just take a little core and just dig down and see how deep you're getting your water. Um, and then also you want to water in the morning, not at night. When you're watering at night, you're setting up disease potential disease organisms um, when it's dark, when it's cooler, it's a little bit humid around the turf grass plants at night and you're going to set up a lot of disease situations. So if you do have irrigation, if you do have to water, um, go, do it before you go to work. You know, even if you have to get up at 4.30 in the morning and turn that hose on um, or buy a timer that turns it on for you at 4.30 in the morning and then set it to run for only as long as you need it to run, whether that's, you know, a half an hour or two hours, it doesn't matter. But it's well worth it instead of losing your entire lawn to a disease. And then only water your grass till it's well established. And by well established, we mean after about two to three mowings on that young seedling set, okay? Um, and this just talks about the use of water. Um, we use over 7.9 billion gallons on landscapes a day in the United States, and that's drinkable water. That's not, you know, that's water that's costing you money out of your pocket. Um, we don't want to use sprinklers during the heat of the day because you can lose all, almost all of your water to um, evaporation into the air, so it's not hitting your soil. Um, you also want to make sure you're not watering the street, the house, the sidewalk, you know, in your neighbor's house or whatever. So pay attention to where that sprinkler is hitting or your water is going. Don't let it run down the drain or form puddles because that's not benefiting your landscape plants. It's wasting money and it also has impacts on our stormwater systems as well. Also, you want to make sure that you're, you're watering what you want to water in your lawn. Maybe you've got something that you don't want to put, a plant that doesn't need so much water. So really pay attention to where that water's going. When we talk about weeds, and this is what every, this is the, the hot part of the conversation that everybody came to hear about. Um, when we talk about weeds, if you're doing everything that we already talked about up to this point, you should have very, very few weeds, okay? Um, like I said, my husband is a turf grass manager, um, and he manages most of our lawns, and we hand pull our crabgrass in about three or four weeks because we've got it down. He mows at the right height. We fertilize in the fall, and, you know, we, we're not irrigating, and we have very little weed problems. So it can be done. It may take you two or three years to get there, but it can be done. And once again, a few weeds in your lawn are not a problem, okay? If you have, it's green. Like David said, what's your bottom line? Do you want a weed-free, completely perfect lawn that's going to cost you a lot of money that you may lose in a drought? Or as long as it's green, you know, what's important to you? In this article, like I said, I keep referring back to this because it's a really good article. She talks about that in the Herald Leader today. Um, so you just want to make sure that you're doing, you know, appropriate irrigation, appropriate fertilization, appropriate mowing, and you're not going to have so many weeds. 
But when you do have weeds, and we're all going to have a few of them, you want to determine why you've got weeds. Um, maybe your lawn care company, you've got a mowing company that comes in. And a lot of the companies, when they go from lawn to lawn to lawn, it's kind of like when you send your kids off to school and everybody else's kids are there and, you know, somebody's got a cold and, you know, somebody's got a stomach ache, but they're at school anyway, where your kids are going to come home with all those germs. Or when we go to work, you know, you're going to pick up what's out there from everybody else. Your lawn care company, if they're mowing for you, they're bringing everything to your lawn from everybody else's lawn that they've mowed prior. It could be Bermuda grass, it could be a, a brown patch disease, it could be dandelion seeds, it could be anything. So if you do have a lawn mowing company, you might ask them to take a blower before they come onto your property and clean their mower equipment off. Now they may argue with you or they may not want to do it or they may say, I'm done with you because you're too difficult. But think about the potential problems that you could be saving yourself for that. So you want to make sure and f figure out why you've got that weed. Um, also, you want to know exactly what that weed is. Is it a good weed? Is it a bad weed? Is it a weed you want or a weed you don't, you don't want? Um, we can identify those at extension. I know I take them by, you can take me a, take a picture and email it to me. Um, I'm, Jamie could probably do that or their Master Gardener Association can do that there. I did bring a weed form here that you can pick up and if you've got a weed, you can put it in a, you dig it up, put it in a a Ziploc bag, staple it to this weed form, and you can take it to your extension office and you, the master gardeners will identify that for you. So you'll know if you've got a grassy weed or a broad weed. You'll know if it's a if it really is a violet that you can, you know, maybe control, or do you want to keep that weed? So it's it's all in knowing exactly what you're dealing with. So it's real important to know, and I talked to somebody about um, you know, if you've got dead spots in your lawn or a specific weed place in your lawn, dig down and see if you're looking at gravel. See, that, see what's underneath that soil, what's causing that weed, because our weed is going to grow where you can't get grass to grow so well. So know why there's nothing there. Maybe you need to fix that one spot that's dead in your lawn. Maybe that needs to come out. Maybe it's a place where you spilled gasoline when you were mowing. Maybe it's beside the edge of a driveway or a sidewalk where you applied de-icing products back in the winter and all of a sudden you notice it's dead. Think about what came before. You know, what happened before? Where does your water run off of if you've got runoff from a street or a driveway or a sidewalk? walk or your neighbor's lawn that maybe put some chemicals, maybe they sprayed Roundup and it ran down into your yard. Maybe salt or de-icing products ran down through your yard and caused a dead spot. So think about what's happening to cause the weeds before you try to fix it. But once again, I can't emphasize enough, if you do all the things we're talking about, you're not going to need a lot of chemical because your grass is going to be healthy. <coughs> Um, we don't have a lot of insects here in um, Kentucky as far as lawn insects. So a few, your insects out there are probably going to be the good insects or an insect that's not going to hurt your turf grass. It may hurt your roses, it may hurt something else, but it probably won't hurt your, your turf grass. So once again, know what you've got. We do identification at the extension offices on your insects as well. You bring them in in a Ziploc bag, we can tell you what it is, and a lot of those insects you're going to bring in are good insects that are going to take care of the bad guys. So that's really important. And there are good insects out there that can take care of the bad insects. And the microorganisms in your soil are very, very important, okay? They're very important. So it's important not to use a lot of insecticides unless you know why you're using them. On chemical use, it's really important, like I talked about, homeowners are the biggest, the biggest source of chemical problems in our environment today. We know that when you go in any of our home, uh, lawn and garden places, I mean, most of what's there is homeowner chemicals. Um, I talk to people on a weekly basis that they think if they put a little on, that more is better. Oftentimes with our lawn chemicals, that is just not the case. Um, you will get worse results oftentimes by putting more than the label allows. And oftentimes, um, 
it's going to cause you problems down the road or it may cause problems with associated plants around that that you really didn't intend to harm. Also, the label is the law. That is a legal document, that piece that is attached to your bottle. So if you go off of that label, if you apply more than it says, if you apply it to plants or in situations that are not listed on that label and it causes problem for your neighbor, it causes problem for our, your city, as in stormwater issues or other runoff issues, you can be held legally liable. And that's really important, and I think enough ho homeowners really don't understand that piece. So it's really important for you to know that and, and share that information, if nothing else. So always identify what's going on and why you want to put a chemical on, and then think first and spray last. So once again, you just want to make sure you're mowing correctly, watering appropriately as needed. Don't over fertilize. Use your soil test to make sure that you're getting the appropriate fertilizers on. Make sure you're identifying your symptoms and your problems, especially with insects and diseases, before you're letting yourself or others put chemicals on your lawn. And you only use those chemicals as a last resort. Um, we do have a lot of information for you with the, at the University of Kentucky and other extension services across the country. Um, one of our newer sites is the Sea Blue Go Green um, website, and it's got a whole bunch of different areas. It's got commercial, business, homeowner, um, you name it, it's on there. I highly encourage you to look at that. And then I've just, there's a whole lot of resources at the back on my presentation. Um, and this will be up on the website as well. And I sent Shelby a lot of these already. But I would suggest that you look at some of those if you're interested more in depth um, on lawn care. So do you have time for questions or? Main questions with the tall turf. Tall fescue? Tall fescue. Mm -hmm. Do they have shade tolerant versions of that? Um, turf type tall fescue takes a lot of different situations. Like I said, shade is one. Um, that is a huge question I always get. You cannot grow grass in the shade well at all. With There's really nothing out there that does that. If you want to grow turf in the shade, you have to seed in the spring and the fall. Okay, and you have to fertilize half rate in the spring and in the fall, and you have to do that every single year. The best thing to do, like I said, with anything else, is not to fight the problem, but to think about alternative ways to deal with that problem better, whether it's mulch, whether it's you know ground covers, or just anything else. But don't fight it. So, real quick, mm -hmm. clover. Clover. Clover can be very beneficial to your lawn because it fixes nitrogen, which adds nitrogen back to your lawn. Um, it's green. It has a beautiful flower. Uh, so that's the, you know, sometimes we need to just change our paradigm of how we think of it. Now, if you don't like the clover and you want to get rid of the clover, 2,4-D products do take care of that, or there's some three-way mixes. Um, David was talking about that, and they took MCPP off the label, but there's a lot of three-way mixes. It's a mix of 2,4-D and several other chemicals in it. And read the label on those, and when it says clover, that's the one you want to pick. 